Pikmin as a series is a commentary on colonization. And I don't mean that just in the sense of the Huckatations and Copites coming to Planet P in a form or to take its resources, but I'm also saying that in the sense of the Pikmin themselves as colonizers. Hi, I'm Al, and let's talk. Pikmin is a unique real-time action strategy hybrid game as you command a horde of tiny creatures to battle and gather all kinds of objects. This is done for survival, both literally, with the dolphins pieces crashing to the plant in Pikmin 1, and then also in Pikmin 3 gathering the fruit, but figuratively too, as the survival of Omar's livelihood at the Hoctate Freight is on the line with collecting treasure and paying back the debt in Pikmin 2. Pikmin 4 is a combination of both the literal and figurative meanings, where you as the Rescue Corps is primarily at PNF 404 to save Olimar and the other castaways, but you also gather sparkling from the excess treasure to explore the planet. I suppose that Pikmin 2 could be argued both as well, since you have to go back to the planet to save Louie after you pay off your debt, but that's debatable. That previously mentioned planet that the Pikmin games are set on was dubbed PNF 404 by the Copites in Pikmin 4. The setting of the Pikmin games is an eerie one that might imply that PNF 404 is a post-climate change Earth recovering, or maybe just a different alternate version of the Earth. So there's some disagreements about those claims, about PNF 404 being Earth, and that's not really what I want to get into here in this video. PNF 404 is a planet with signifiers from another long-lost civilization that's now overrun with wildlife and full of predators. This lends the series to be a brutal, naturalistic environment where nature will prevail over all. But alongside that point, I think that maybe the series is saying something more, and maybe even a little more sinister. So in the past there have been discussions and video essays on Pikmin being a capitalism commentary, and while I don't want to disagree with that, I don't think it's complete. Now to me, I think that the Pikmin games are more so a commentary on colonization both as the act of colonization, the act or practice of appropriating something that one does not have the right to, and also in the biological sense of colonization, the spread and development of organisms in a new area or habitat. And while these two examples of colonization are separate, I think that in some ways they go hand in hand, which I will further discuss. The first kind of colonization that we'll talk about is what's known as exploitative colonization, or extractivism which is defined as tending towards or resulting in withdrawal of natural resources by extraction with no provision or replenishment. Or that can also be thought of as exploitation of the area's native resources and labor for the good of the colonizer. This is the kind of colonization that the Hoctations and Copites actively engage in. The resources of the planet PNF 404 are taken for use in the game's Pikmin 2 through 4. In Pikmin 2, these treasures are brought back to Huckatate to pay off the debt of the Huckatate Freight. And then, later, Olimar and the President go back to the plant to become ridiculously wealthy. Or, let's be real, they go back to make the President ridiculously wealthy. In Pikmin 3, the Copites are there for fruit, and in the DLC, the Huckatations are back for more treasure, since the Huckatate Freight engaged in failed business ventures, so they are there for the sparkling value of the treasures around the plant. In Pikmin 4, the main purpose of the game is to rescue Captain Olimar and all the other castaways who came for a variety of reasons to the planet, including those who came to make their own fortune from the planet's treasures. Pikmin 1 falls outside of these reasons, but acts more like the reason as to why Olimar came to Planet 404 in the first place. Olimar's crash landing accident in Pikmin 1 is not too different from the discovery of other areas that are colonized, much like how America was discovered by Christopher Columbus. That same Christopher Columbus, who would have otherwise perished in his attempt to get to the Indies, later came back to the same area and treated the natives who otherwise saved his crew by exploiting their labor and taking their people. To quote Extractivism and Neo-Extractivism, two sides of the same curse by Alberto Escal, Extractivism is not limited to minerals or oil. Extractivism is also present in farming, forestry, and even in fishing. Insofar, this means that there's exploitation in industry as well as in gathering the raw elements. Both renewable and non-renewable resources can be taken into consideration. In taking resources from the environment, harm is done directly to the environment itself. Now, in taking resources from the environment, there's no consideration given to the natives that would use these resources or from the planet itself that they're taken from. 
But what then do we think of the treasures themselves? I think that we can place fruit in the camp of a renewable resource, but what about things like the bottle caps and the jar lids and the batteries? Are these resources or are they like trash? But from our perspective, isn't this stuff all rubbish that was just discarded? Is that really fair to compare? I think that point is considered fair enough. None of the treasure in the Pikmin games really have any intrinsic value to the creatures living on planet PNF 404. The planet doesn't have a concept of money or trade in their ecosystem. I think that the better question to ask yourself is that in taking these items from the environment, does that cause harm to the wildlife itself? Should we also give consideration to the creatures that carry around these items that we find too? Are taking these items from the creatures in the environment a form of violence? And I don't just mean that in the sense of defeating them to take their respective treasure that they're guarding. In this example, resources like oil aren't being drilled from the ground, but the Pikmin sometimes must dig up these treasures to be taken, for example. In comparison, I kind of think this point comes off as weak. I do think that maybe it could be considered reasonable to argue that indeed killing some of these creatures that are holding their treasure is a form of violence, both because you see it happening in the game as you do it, but also consider the ramifications of removing a piece of fruit or treasure from the environment. Maybe no creatures are holding or consuming the fruit at the time, but it does exist as a finite resource. The existence of which resource is the whole reason why the Copites came to the planet in the first place. And so, in Pikmin 3, the fruit is juiced and the seeds are brought home back to the planet of Kapai. Now, take fruit for example. The fruit would have been eaten by the area's local fauna. The seeds of that fruit would have been digested in their stomachs and then excreted in a form of fertilizer. And this would have just naturally balanced the ecosystem's level of fruit. I don't think that, by most, violence would be considered in these actions. Especially since we have few degrees of separation. But removing a food source from the said ecosystem with no replacement is exactly the kind of violence inherent in extractivism. The lack of consideration for the natural fauna of the planet and the ecosystem's food levels. People don't consider colonization in the sense of the Hakutations and Kalpites because they're not on the land to develop it because the atmosphere therefore is made up of poisonous oxygen, but they're still there as colonizers. Furthermore, I also think that the Pikmin themselves are colonizers and could be considered an invasive species. Well, hold on, because first we need to understand what an invasive species is and what colonizers are in the regards to the Pikmin themselves. So next, I'll be explaining why I think that the Pikmin themselves are an invasive species of colonizers. Invasive species is defined as a non-native species that causes harm to the environment, economy, or human, animal, or plant health. And in a biological sense, to colonize is to spread and develop in an area or habitat. So next you might be thinking, well, Pikmin themselves can't be an invasive species because they're native to the planet PNF-404. And while yes, Pikmin themselves are native to the planet, each type of Pikmin is not native to each map on the planet PNF-404. Let's explain this more with another example. If you go into a state park and go hiking, you may have inadvertently stepped on some plant barbs and then they get stuck to your hiking boot. You leave the park and come home later that night. The next week, you head out with the same hiking boots and hike in another state park that's 20 miles away in the opposite direction, and some of the barbs fall off your boots. The barbs contain seeds from a bull thistle, which is not native to the park that you came to the week after the first park where they rubbed off on your boots. Eventually, the seeds of this bull thistle sprout and you have brought a poisonous weed into a new ecosystem and invasive species. So, how does this exactly relate to Pikmin again? Well, while Pikmin may be native to the planets of PNF 404, the different types of Pikmin aren't native to each area in PNF 404. Much like how you can have thistles and weeds in every state park, not every state park has the same thistles and weeds. In each Pikmin game, the onions of each Pikmin are divided into the different area maps. For example, blue Pikmin are found in the forest navel, but not found natively at the impact site. Yellow Pikmin are found at the Perplexing Pool. Red Pikmin are found in the Tropical Wilds. So I can see how this point might be confusing because once you get a Pikmin type, you can bring it with you to any part of the map. But what I'm saying is that not each type of Pikmin is native to each area's map. Much like how you can have different thistles and weeds in each state park, not every state park has the same kind of thistles and weeds. In that sense, not each area on the map has the same kind of native Pikmin. 
In this example, you've also introduced Pikmin of a different kind to an area that it's not native to. Pikmin are also definitively prey. They don't eat any other species on the planet, or really any other thing in the game. Maybe nectar? And also, Pikmin are more flora than fauna. More plants than animals. But prey can still be an invasive species even if they aren't a predator to another animal in a few key ways. Invasive species compete for resources that the native prey use within their niche. This decreases the amount of food, water, and areas to habitate for the native prey, making it harder for their native populations to stasis. Conversely, the predators in the environment can now favor the invasive species. This increases the amount of prey and, in turn, native predators. If the predator population then becomes too large, they can wipe out the invasive species, native species, or both population species as a food source. Once this happens, with an increase in the predator population, the predators will need a new source of food, or in turn, they will die out without a stable prey population. Invasive prey indirectly increases predation, even if the prey itself does fight back. In Pikmin, if you look in-game, you can see places in the elements, both natural and artificial, that keep the Pikmin from inhabiting different areas. There are areas like the Perplexing Pool in Pikmin 2 that have these electric fences across from a pool of water. Even if the native yellow Pikmin come in contact with that area, they would not be able to cross the body of water by themselves. There are also obstacles like the electric fences in the Garden of Hope in Pikmin 3 that would keep the native blue and rock Pikmin from exploring further, and similarly in Pikmin 1, the forest navel has a large population of fiery blowhogs. This area is natively populated with blue Pikmin, and the blue Pikmin would burn when they come in contact with the fiery blowhogs. While Pikmin 4 has caves and night missions with a larger variety of Pikmin to an area, these particular areas have much smaller amounts of native Pikmin that also would have to adapt it and compete for the resources while underground. The gold Pikmin of Pikmin 4 also only come out at night or in caves. Now, I don't think I've definitively explained how Pikmin are an invasive species. Couldn't Pikmin then therefore be considered pests? In just my previous example, I mentioned how the yellow Pikmin are native to the perplexing pole, but there are electric fences around that area. The yellow Pikmin probably evolved to become immune to electricity because of the proximity of electrical hazards to their onion's native habitat. This would also explain why in the forest navel there are blue Pikmin. These blue Pikmin evolved to thrive in water, away from the predators, the fiery blowhogs that inhabit the land, each in their respective niche. In that sense, I think that Pikmin are considered pests in areas that they're native to, and in all other cases, Pikmin are considered an invasive species. An invasive species may not immediately thrive in a new area without human intervention. This also would explain why Pikmin populations are so low when you first encounter them, too. While well, Captains Olimar, Louis, the President, Al, Brittany, Charlie, and the Rescue Corps are not human, I think it's fair to say that these Hakatations and Kapites are humanoids. Now, I realize in that sense that leaves out Ochi and Moss, which are co-captains, respectively, in Pikmin 4, but these are space dogs that don't act independently unless you command them to. This example is considered management implications and is how an invasive species grows and survives. Keys to this include the invasive species' ability to germinate and grow rapidly. A short growth period leads to a higher chance of an invasive species' ability to thrive in a new area. In most cases understood in the article, humans are the ones that bring these exotic fauna to the foreign ecosystems. And isn't that just what's happening when you bring a new Pikmin onion type to an area that it's not native to, or when you fuse two different onion types together? Even in-game, after a Pikmin population has been completely wiped, the onion will then produce a single seed to allow you to restart a new population of the Pikmin. The long-term ability of an invasive species to thrive on their own is dependent on their ability to adapt both to their environment and with other genetically similar species. I have, as well as many others, compared Pikmin to ants, so let's look at another example with Argentinian ants. Reduced genetic variation and success of an invasive species. In this, it was found that invasive species, the Argentinian ants, that they thrive more as they work with other ants native to the area, what's known as a supercolony forms. In a supercolony, there is no intraspecific aggression. The ants started to work together. By contrast, the unicolonial ant colonies didn't survive as long. In-game, there are a couple of examples of the Pikmin fighting each other. 
but usually only after something like they're transformed into mushroom pikmin by the spores of a puff sewer, or I guess you could say arguably bulb men. However, we can see with Pikmin evolution from the games like Pikmin 3 and 4 that the onions all merge together and that the different types of Pikmin will work together with Olimar or whatever captain you are playing. Compare this then to the unicolonial Pikmin, where it be when you find a new Pikmin type, buy their onion, or in a cave when these Pikmin are not doing so well on their own. These found Pikmin once recruited are happy to head into their reflective type of onion or their combined onion with the other Pikmin in Pikmin's 3 and 4. While I think you could argue that in Pikmin 2, the purple and white Pikmin enter your ship instead of one of the other three onions, both the purple and white Pikmin do cohabitate with each other on your ship with Captains Olimar and Louie. Compare this also to when Pikmin are left on their own at the end of the day. They will be eaten by the wild predators on the planet below, and you can see after finishing a game that the Pikmin then all work together regardless of their type to thrive in their new environment. Each Pikmin type will need to cohabitate with the other Pikmin types, much like the Argentinian ant counterparts, to be considered a successful invasive species. Conclusively, this theme of colonization is about the habitation of the Pikmin themselves. What consideration does the plan of PNF 404 have for its native population and the rights to the resources? So is this even a fair conversation to begin with, since PNF 404, the planet itself, doesn't even have an economy? And whether or not that was the intent, I do think it is fair to invoke the death of the author, or in this case, the death of the game developer. What is this game telling the player, or specifically me, Al Tox? What kind of insights can I draw as I play? But what I think is more sinister if you look past the celebrations of the endings of the Pikmin games is that in order to get there, you're still exploiting the planet's resources. And this is really troubling if you're someone that considers PNF 404 to be kind of a post-climate change Earth. Much like how our current planet's decline from the effects of climate change is not always viewed as a bad thing, but as the resilience of humanity's innovation. In that regard, I think that the Pikmin games are successful as a commentary on colonization. If you've watched with me so far from the beginning, thank you very much. If you click up here, this might be a video that you'll enjoy. And if you're in the future, you can go on right away to the next season. Alright, thanks for watching. Bye bye.